Good morning, St. Mark. Good morning. So glad you're here. A special welcome to our guests. I saw a few of you come in today. Um, we're so glad you're here. We want to comfort you with God's love and God's truth and God's peace and so much more today. That's what we're here to do, to just to bring you in the presence of God, offer you just the awe that we have, the joy we have, and what he's done for us. You're going to see... Um, that move through our service. We're, we're uh, just to let you know, we're in a sermon series on the book of Habakkuk. We're letting him teach us and guide us and instruct us in life. And as we, we're thinking about hardship in life today, we're thinking about suffering in life. That's where we start here in the book of Habakkuk. And we're going to open up with Immovable Our Hope Remains, this hymn that helps us think about how solid our hope is no matter what is going on in our lives. I want to invite you to sing this song as you feel comfortable. we're going to say in our worship service today is that God is our rock and we know that he's our rock because we are at peace with him. He's on our side because we are forgiven. Let's remember that and receive that right now. Please stand as we confess our sins and receive his forgiveness. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. 
Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own grievous fault. Therefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grants you pardon and forgiveness of all your sins for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's join in a song of praise. Let us pray. O oh God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace that we have, may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today comes from 1 Kings chapter 3. And here we see it in the life of Solomon, the great king. The fundamental need that we all have is for God to teach our hearts wisdom. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne to this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. The word of the Lord. At this time, I want to ask you to please stand out of respect for the words and works of Christ, the wisest man who ever lived. We're reminded, especially at the end of his teaching here, that we need him to teach us, to guide us and correct us. This is his teaching. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and kept caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnish, furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated, and uh, you're welcome to join uh, in, in the hymn of the day. This is a hymn that helps us start pondering the difficulties that we have in life.
Well, the poetry in that hymn, it sets you up here to think about difficulty in life, the goodness of God, even through it. And here, buckle up, because Habakkuk's going to draw you deeper into that idea. Here's what he teaches us here. He's got a prayer for us. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he, is, he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet, for by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. The word of the Lord. We've been, uh, this summer, we've been taking up the book of Habakkuk. And we've been doing that for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that it's God's word. And God's word is our light. And God's word is our lamp. And God's word is our foundation in every trouble in life. Now I'm quoting the Bible about the Bible. And so I'm going to do it again. I'm going to quote the Bible about the Bible when it says all scriptures God breathed. And I would submit to you right here, right now, that God doesn't waste his breath. And so he says all scripture is is God breathed. And this is why it's here. He says it's for teaching. And all the Christians say check. We like teaching. Give us the teaching, God. We like the teaching. And the verse goes on and says, it's for all training. It's for training in righteousness. We say, check, check. All the Christians say, check. We like that. We want the training in righteousness. We like that. But then it also says, it's for correcting and rebuking. And we're not so sure about that. I'm a student of churches. I, I'm a pastor in church. I'm also a student of churches. One of the things I like to do is I like to see how churches are talking to, to Christians and non-Christians out in the world. And you look at the media and you look at the, what they're putting out and they say you should come to church on Sunday. I, this is what they say. And I'm, for years, I, I noticed this stuff. And here's one of the things I've never seen from a Christian. I've, I've never seen it. It doesn't, seem, it doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just that I haven't seen it. But I've never seen this. You should come to church on Sunday get really excited about it because God is going to confront you. <laughs> he's, got, he's got something that he's going he's to talk about your behavior. He's going to correct you. He's going to rebuke you. you. Get ready. Get excited. Never seen it. I actually, I actually think that, that this is one of the things that makes St. Mark unique is that what we're trying to do at, at our church is we're actually trying to give you an authentic Christianity. We are trying to give you the whole thing, not just the parts that make you ecstatic. There are, there are those parts, those, those parts that make you hope against all hope, that, that, that burst your imagination and all the wonderful things that God is going to do for you. We want you to have that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We want you to have that. Also, we want you to stu- have, have the stuff that's going to challenge you. 
We want you to have the experience that Mary had. When Mary had Jesus, the first, she didn't just say, wow, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. Instead, she pondered it. There was something so challenging about Jesus that night. Not only was she on cloud now and wow, I'm the mother of the Lord, but she also had to stop and think about it a long time. She was challenged. And so that's why I've alluded to it already. That's why we're picking up a backup. We have this discipline and we're saying we want the whole thing. We want all of Christianity. We want all of it. And, we, and we're going to bump up along the way and we're going to find out right here in Habakkuk that Scripture is not just for our teaching in Scripture. Check, we like that. It's not just for training in righteousness. Check, tell me how to do life with God and with each other. Check, it's also for this. It's for rebuke. It's for a confrontation with God. In fact, if, you, if you, you can't see it in the NIV, but in, in the KJV translation, if you look at it, you can see that in the first verse and in the last verse, you have bookends. Here, Habakkuk is saying this section of the Bible is about God's correction, God's discipline, God's chastisement in life. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about it, and we're going to talk about it like this. We're, first of all, we're going to notice the reality of of God's discipline in our lives, the reality of it. It does happen. And the second thing we're going to see with Habakkuk is God's purpose in it. Why does he chastise us? Why does he discipline us? And then finally, we're going to look at God's limit, the limit, the hard limit that God puts on discipline in our lives. But first, we've got to notice this with Habakkuk. It happens. Discipline happens. You can see it right there in verse 12. He starts out with that. He's, God just said to Habakkuk, the Babylonians are going to come. They're going to sweep across. They're going to take out God's people in Judah. This is what happens. And, and Habakkuk says, this is what it is. And I'm going to quote it to you right here. This is what it, what it says. It says, Lord, Habakkuk says this. This is what it is, Lord. Lord, you have appointed them for what? For judgment. This is what it is, for correction. God is, God is the one doing this. You, my rock, have, I'm going to borrow from the KJV right now, for clarity, you have established them for correction. So why in the world was Babylon going to come and take out Judah? Why? For correction, for chastisement. You see it right, look at it again, verse 14. You, Habakkuk is describing what the Babylonians are going to do. He says that, that they're going to be the fishermen and God's people are going to be the fish. And so what's going to happen is they're going to get hooked and they're going to get netted. And Habakkuk attributes all of that to God. And so what Habakkuk is teaching you right here, right now, is that God did, and God does, and God will discipline you. Now that's a challenge. I was thinking about this week. That's a big challenge. I was thinking about this. Uh, there, was a, there was a piece that came out. I want to remember the, the woman's name, right? Her, her name was Susie Welch. She was a uh, she is a professor at NYU's School of Business, and she wrote a piece this week all about this phenomenon out on TikTok called lazy girl jobs. Apparently, there's this phenomenon on TikTok where uh, young women are getting advice about how to find jobs that are super, super easy and low stress so they can do, go and, and live their lives. And Susie Welch it's, explains that it's, it, this isn't because these young women are lazy, actually. It's because they're afraid. They are so afraid of stress and anxiety and discomfort and trouble in life that they're going to do anything possible to make sure it never comes into their lives. This is a challenge to us. Because here God is saying that not only does he allow stress and discomfort and anxiety to come into our lives, he is saying he is the one 
who sends it. That's a challenge. Not only is that a challenge to our lifestyles, Lord, I don't, I don't want to stress, I don't want to have anxiety, I don't, I don't, I don't want to hurt. Not only is that a, that a challenge to our lifestyles, it is a challenge probably at some level to our view of God. There was a, there was a gold standard study that came out a few years ago that, that said Here, here's what Americans think God is like. Here's their image of God. And it goes in and read the results of the study. This is what Americans spiritually thinking God is like. This is a quote. God is not demanding. He actually can't be because God's job, listen to this, God's job, according to most Americans, is to solve our problems and make people feel good. In short, God is something like combination, divine butler, and cosmic therapist. He is always on call, takes care of any problems that arise, and professionally helps people feel better about themselves. And so this is a challenge. Not only to our lifestyles, but to our view of God. Because here we find out that God will stress you. And he will challenge you. And he will put you through the ringer. And he will put you in the fire. And he will make you walk on coals. And he will chastise you and discipline you. And he will do all of that. He did. He does. And he will. Now at some level, I do want to point out that this idea is actually very helpful to you. I think it's very helpful to you. It's very, very helpful to you. And I want to tell you why it's helpful to you. Why is it helpful to you? Because it changes, it transforms the way that you should see stress and anxiety and trouble in your life. See, what God is teaching you here is that suffering is not merely suffering. Trouble is not merely trouble. God is in it. That's what he's teaching you here. See, that is very, very helpful in life because if you don't know that, if you don't realize that, this is what you're going to think. You're either going to move into self-blame or you're going to move into self-pity. You're going to move into self-pity because you're going to say, there's this trouble in my life. I got the short end of the stick. Must have. God unlucky. That's what you're going to have to say. And you and see what happens. Then you, you experience something, some kind of trouble. You move to self-pity and there's barely anything worse in life than somebody who self-pities. And if you don't move into self-pity, then you're going to move into self-blame. You're going to say, man, I should have thought about that one a little bit more. I should have made a different decision. How could I have done that? And see, see, it's either self-blame or self-pity. Both are terrible. And what God is saying, it's neither one. When you experience trouble, it's not just trouble. When you experience stress, it's not just stress. When you experience anxiety, it's not just anxiety. God is in it. God is disciplining you. Now, if that's right, and I'm arguing that it is right now, here's what you should do when that happens in your life. Listen to it. Listen to it. That's what I try to do. Here's a true story. So back in June, I said to my wife, I said, it's been a big year for me. We were just having one of those intimate conversations. It's been a big year. Overwhelming blessing. Challenging year. (laughs) Not at home, we had two newborn babies come in. Two, Two. Two at once. It's a challenge. More for her than for me, but still, a massive challenge. And then at church, God was so good to let me be a part of a turnaround church. All of a sudden, we go, we, we're, we're this church and we're, all, we're thriving all of a sudden. And I said, I said to my wife, I said, this June, I, I, want, I want a breather. I, I think I need a breather. And I even talked to God about it. I even said, I said Lord, <laughs> I de- this is it. I need some peace. I need a breather. It's summer. We're going to have it. And then you know what happened? my daughter got really, really sick. She's recovered now. So I said, Lord, Lord, this is what I need. I need a a breather. And God said, no. (laughs) 
No, you don't. You don't need the kind of peace you think you need. You need me. See? This is what God does. He did, he does, and he will discipline you. But see, now I did it. I actually already did it. I ruined, I ruined this part of the sermon because I tried to make it into nice little parts and I actually sort of started ruining the second part because the first part was like, this is the reality of discipline, but then I already started talking, didn't I, about the purpose of it. He's got purpose in it. He's trying to do something to you in it. And you notice that with Habakkuk, you notice this with Habakkuk, Habakkuk finds out God is disciplining him. God is chastising him. Massive war is going to come in. This is discipline. And what ends up happening, you just read it, verses 12 and 13, what ends up happening there is Habakkuk starts to think about God. And he starts to think about his relationship to God. So you look at this, he gets chastised, and, and immediately, what does Habakkuk say? He starts, he starts thinking about God. He says, God, you're from everlasting. He's thinking about God. He says, God, you have no beginning and you have no end. God, you are before all things. God, you are after all things. God, you are the end of all ends. God, you got no limits. You're, you're the infinitude of all infinitude. God, that's who you are. And also, God, you don't die. God, you don't die. I know that about you, God. He's thinking about God. He says, God, you are not just the author of life. He says, God, you are life. You can't die. He's thinking about God, and then he starts thinking about his relationship to God. He says, since God, since that's true, since you've got no end. And God, since you, God, since you are life. God, that makes you my rock. God, that means you, you're my God and you don't end and you don't die. That means I can't die. This discipline, it can't end in death. I know that about you. You're, you're my rock. In fact, God, it's, it, I don't think it can be this bad. I actually don't think it can be this bad because I know you, God. I know you, God. I know you, God. I know, God, I know that you are so pure that you can't even look on evil. See, see sight is, is, the, is the sense, our, our power of sense that, that reaches the farthest from us. There's, there's one sense, sense of touch. You touch it and it's right there it's close to you God he's saying God not only can you not touch evil you can't even see it God this doesn't make any sense to me that you're bringing bringing in a more evil people the Babylonians than us to chastise us God I don't think you can do this and he's thinking about God and he's thinking about his relationship to God many years ago now the reformers noticed this pattern that they even had it. They even had a catchphrase for what's happening here in the back of his life. They had a catchphrase for it. It was Latin, but still, it's helpful. They said oratio, meditatio, tentatio. It has a nice little rhyme to it. And they said, this is what's happening. This is what happens in Christian life. Here, here's the pattern. You pray, you meditate, and you suffer. You pray, you meditate, and you suffer. See, what happens is you suffer. And when you suffer, all of a sudden you start praying more. Have you ever noticed this phenomenon in your life? You start suffering, you start praying more. This is, when, this is always when you're praying the most, when you suffer the most. And when you pray more, what happens is all of a sudden you're thinking about God more. You're thinking about, you're getting clear on God. You're drawing closer to God. You're thinking about, who is this God? And you're wrestling with him and you're, and you're thinking about him. You pray and you meditate and you suffer. And what ends up happening, the reformers noticed, is a virtuous cycle. You suffer and then you pray more and then you pray more and you get clear on God and you get clear on God and you suffer. 
And he said, this is what makes you a theologian. And it's true, who knew God most and best? It's the people who have suffered the most. And so David in the Bible, and Moses in the Bible, and Habakkuk in the Bible, and out of the Bible, Martin Luther, who suffered from anxiety, and C.F.W. Walther, who suffered from depression, and Gerhard, who had multiple, multiple family members die. And so you pray, and you meditate, and you suffer, and you draw closer to God, and you know God better. I have, I have this encouragement for you in that as it happens in your own life. Just this. Stay in it. Stay in the wrestling match. You know what you should be like? This is what I think you should be like. I think you should be like Jacob in the Bible. You wrestle with God and you do not let him go until he blesses you. You stay in the wrestling match. I want to encourage you to I want to encourage you in that. There is a blessing there. There is a you keep wrestling with God in your sufferings. It's a blessing there. I'm going to encourage you with that. And then I want to encourage you with that with a couple of thoughts. The first one is this. Do you realize this about trouble? Here's the trouble with trouble. God blesses you not despite trouble, but rather through it. Ah, oh, that's the trouble of trouble. It blesses you. <laughs> That's the trouble, trouble, it blesses you. It's not despite suffering. Sometimes it's through it that God blesses you. And here's the trouble that as you think about that, the trouble, trouble, here's the trouble with God, if I could be provocative like that. The trouble with God is that he actually loves you. That's the trouble. He authentically loves you. If he didn't love you, he'd say, do whatever you want. Have a nice life. Back to, you know, parental, think about it like this. Jesus made God your father. And the Proverbs tell us this. Here's the number one way to hate your kid. Let them do whatever they want. Don't discipline them. That's how to hate your kid. And the trouble with God is that he loves you. He actually loves you. So he's going to allow you and sometimes send into your life trouble. The trouble with God is that he actually loves you, that he wants to be your father. So, so stay in the wrestling match. Don't let him go until he blesses you. And that brings me to this. I want to I tie this up in a nice little bow for you. At least I'm going to try. <laughs> and I want to do it like this. Show you that in your life, God puts a hard limit on discipline. And I want to show that to you by bringing you in just one little phrase. It's one little phrase, very provocative little phrase. People debate it all over the place. I want to bring you into it. And it's this little phrase where Habakkuk says in verse 12, he says, my God, my Holy One, you will never die. Now, that's a very provocative little phrase. Such a provocative, maybe, maybe not provocative to you, but I'm going to try to make it provocative to you. Did you know that ancient Christians were so, so upset, they were so upset that Habakkuk would say something like this that they thought he was wrong? They did. They actually thought he was wrong. So the ancient scribes looked at this and they said, well, no, no Christian would ever suggest, that, and even in denying it, that God would ever die. They would never say that. Nobody would ever say that, they said. And so what they did is they went into the, they went into the Hebrew text and they changed the vowels. And they said Habakkuk could not have meant that. He could not have meant that God won't die. He must have meant we won't die. And so they changed it. They actually changed it. But that's exactly what Habakkuk said because it was so upsetting to them. 
Why would anybody ever, why would any Christian even, even suggest the possibility, even if they're denying it, that God could die? And what it tells you is that Habakkuk is actually, this is more than just Habakkuk saying God is the author of life. God is, God is life itself. It's more than that. It's actually a challenge. What Habakkuk means to say is this. He means to say, God, if you let us die, you're not really God. That's what he's saying. He's saying, God, it'd be as if you're dead. You're a dead God. You're, if you let us die, if the Babylonians come and they wipe us out, it's like you're not God. It's like, God, you can't die. You can't do that. That's what he's saying. And what he's doing is he is setting up a hard boundary, a hard limit, which is true. God will never, in your life, kill you. He won't kill you. Now you're sitting there saying, so he'll do everything else? No, not exactly. Think, of, think about it like this. What Habakkuk is teaching us is that everything God is doing in your life is leading to more life. Everything. He can't, he can't, God can never work death in your life. Not ultimately. Everything's leading to more life in your life. But here's the deal, church. Here's the deal. Do you realize that as God is working life in your life, he has to do two things in your life, not one? And the reason why God has to do two things in your life, not one, is because you, inside, are two things in your life, not one. Living in you right now is the life of God. You have faith and love and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit wants to raise up more and more and more of that, but also living in you right now is evil. You're saint and sinner. And so God has to do two things in your life, not one. He has to raise up more life. He has to encourage the peace and the joy and the faith. Also, he has to kill off your death. Do you know what it's actually a lot like? Chemo. What's chemo doing in your body? It kills the death off. What's discipline doing in your life? It kills the bad stuff off. Oh, it hurts. That's why it does hurt. It hurts. Look at Habakkuk. He's in so much anguish. He's, he's saying these controversial things. He says, God, you can't die. He's, he's in so much anguish. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. When you're in a marriage that's difficult, that hurts. When you, when you have anxiety that's overwhelming you, it hurts. See, when you, when you have a future and it looks so dark, that hurts. See, but God isn't hurting you. You can know that. I'm wrapping up my sermon now. This is the part where you should really pay attention if I lost you. You can know that now. You got to know it. You can know it. Even if you don't feel it, you can know it. Because of Jesus. Because you take one look at him, take one look at him and you find out that the God who has no beginning and no end ended. The God who is before all things and after all things carried all things. 
So you can know it. You, you can know it. The God, the God who is your rock and your foundation and your center and your core, he fell apart for you. So you got to think about this. The God, who, the God who is so pure, not only can he, he's he not going to touch evil, he's not going to see evil. That God, the scriptures say about him this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's what the scriptures say. This God who can't touch it, who can't see it, carried it so that he doesn't see it on you. Don't you see it? what that means? It means that it was exactly what the contemporary prophet Isaiah said. He carried your punishment, and that punishment brought us peace. So that whatever God is doing in your life, he's not punishing you. He's not harming you. He's not hurting you. He's not troubling you to trouble you. He can't. He can't. He can't. He troubled Jesus because of your trouble. He's not troubling you to trouble you. He's troubling you to help you. Don't you see it? He's disciplining you. Even when it, even, even when it hurts the most. He's actually just holding you. Even when it feels like he's hurting you, he's healing you. Even when it feels like, God, you're killing me right now, he's making you more alive. And how do you know it? Well, because he died to give us life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is by the blood of Jesus that we call you that. And we trust that we are that to you. We know that the trouble in our life is not meant ultimately to trouble us, but to heal us. We ask that you transform trouble and suffering in our lives and in our hearts to draw us closer to you, to help us know you better, to become the kind of people that you want us to be in Christ. Help us root this faith in Christ who died for us. Amen. Please stand. We do have the, uh, the joy this morning of welcoming a couple new members and I would like to um, invite Veronica and um, Akil to come forward at this time as we confess our faith this morning. Akil's like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I want to go in front of everybody. Come on, you can stand right here. And you can just face me. You don't have to look at all those people. They're scary, right? We can do this. And together, um, help out Veronica and Akil. We're going to confess our faith together. Friends in Christ, today you stand before the Lord's altar to declare your desire to be members of St. Mark. Having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of God's word, as confessed by this church, we invite you to declare your unity with us by joining together, all of us, in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's join together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. As you know, believers in Christ gather around his word and sacraments, encourage one another in faith and life, and carry out the work of his kingdom. 
I ask you both, is it your desire to join us in mission and support this work with your prayers and gifts? If so, answer, it is, and I ask God to help me. On the basis of your confession of faith and directed by our mutual commitments, we receive you as members of St. Mark Evangelical Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Akio. You made it through, buddy. <laughs> welcome to St. Mark. And Veronica, welcome to St. Mark. Will you give our new members a warm welcome? And we also, in just a moment, we're going to take um, the offering, but at this time we're going to welcome John Walt to come, and we're going to install him as a member of our church council here as we move into a congregational meeting after worship today. I'll come down there by you. Uh, dear friend in Christ, you have been elected to a public position of service to serve our Lord on behalf of St. Mark. The Lord entrusted you with an office that you are to carry out as a servant according to his word. You are, as a servant of Jesus Christ and worker in this congregation, to set for your own family and the whole church the example of a Christian life. Make the word of God your foundation and guide. Search it daily for comfort and instruction. So that the congregation may be assured of your willingness to serve, I ask you in the presence of God in this congregation, will you diligently and faithfully carry out the office entrusted to you according to the ability which God gives you? Then answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. I now install you in your position on the Council of St. Mark Evangelical Lutheran Church, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go then and give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thank you, John. At this time, um, the offering will be coming around. And if you're a guest here at St. Mark, um, there are little maroon worship registers, and we would love it if you'd share your email address with us or um, a phone number, and we'd be happy to reach out to you. Will the congregation please stand for prayer? We're going to keep in special prayer today um, our church. We're having a congregational meeting uh, immediately following this, and we're going to just take our church into our hearts and pray for her ministry going forward. Let's join together in prayer. <clears throat> 